The 2022 season was the first season in 17 years to feature an increase in the amount of fullbacks used around the NFL. Short might still only be 11% compared to a whopping 36% back in the mid-2000s, but, you know, it did still go up a little bit. But why last year? Like, what made 2022 so special that last year was the time for the pendulum to finally start swinging back the other way? What are the advantages that fullbacks give offenses over modern defenses? Or perhaps more importantly, what about the teams that still want to get those same advantages over a defense, but without actually having a fullback on the field? What do they do? Well, naturally, there are a lot of different nuanced answers to those questions. I'm going to do my best to provide those answers today. But as always, if you have any follow up questions or you need me to expand on anything else, my Discord is linked down in the description below. And if you're a Patreon supporter, whether new or old, there is a special room in that Discord just for Patreon supporters that is a lot smaller and a lot easier to get a hold of me in. So uh, with all that said, let's talk about fullbacks. The main advantage of having and using a fullback in the run game is not about adding any more beef or any extra size to your offense to run over smaller modern linebackers, like I'm sure a lot of people assume. It's really about flexibility, ambiguity, and the angles that you can generate in any given run concept. For instance, let's look at this outside zone run from Miami last season. If you want a full breakdown of all the reads and a lot of the technical nuances on the offensive line in outside zone concepts, you can go watch that last episode that I released, which covers all that in detail. I'm not going to rehash it here. But the short version is because the defense outnumbers the offense in the box, mathematically, there's not very many ways to make up for being down a blocker in the run game. So instead, what you want to do is use your fullback to create either favorable angles and spacing for your offense to just ignore that extra defender, or you can use those angles and space to make it really tough for that extra defender to make the tackle in the first place. So knowing that, here's how Miami used their fullback, Alec Ingold, to accomplish that, again by using an ambiguous alignment that had maximum flexibility. From this condensed eye formation, the Dolphins can run basically anything in their playbook to either side of the offense. Inside split zone is an option. They could also run power and have Ingold kick out the front side edge. They could even run counter in a variety of different ways. Or outside split zone lead is also a common call that you see from this kind of look. Hell, they could even call a pass play off of hard play action and use Ingold as a receiver in the flat. The world is pretty much their oyster. And the fact that Ingold is directly in the middle of the formation in the backfield means that he can be inserted into any gap at any time in any style of run concept. So the defense has no idea what to expect here. And if the defense doesn't know which direction you're running or what style of run you're calling, simply because the entire playbook is available to you just based on formation, that's how you can run the ball effectively against basically any defense you want to. Even the Patriots a couple years ago, when they still had Jakob Johnson playing a true fullback role for them, they used that ambiguity in their run game extensively. And keep in mind, they were the 8th ranked run game in DVOA that year, so it clearly worked for them as well. This is a formation that most of the West Coast offense coaching tree, to my knowledge, calls strong right slot. So it's basically a traditional I formation, but with the fullback offset to the strong side and a slot alignment from the receivers to the other side. And again, the advantage to this formation is that you can run basically any concept out of it. With a little pre-snap motion like the 49ers like to do, you can run outside zone to the weak side, or you can keep Johnson over there and run outside zone to the strong side. You could also just run ISO and go straight up the middle behind a couple double teams with Johnson leading up to the second level just because. Whatever gap you want to hit, you can hit. But, as you might have expected, the Patriots didn't call any of those runs here. They actually called a concept that I have not mentioned yet in this video at all, trap. On a trap run, this center and left guard are just going to let the three technique get up the field, and the goal is for that three technique to get trapped by Jakob Johnson in the backfield while the center and the guard climb up to the linebackers on the second level totally unobstructed. They don't need Johnson to blow that defensive tackle away. They just need him to get in the way and not get moved backwards because this style of run hits very fast. The trap lock only needs to hold for about half a second. That's it. He just needs to be strong enough to not lose ground on contact. And the result is that you get four hats on four hats on the line of scrimmage and three more hats on three hats on the second level, 
leaving a corner as that last unblocked defender that we cannot account for. Remember how I said that the goal of two back runs into heavy boxes wasn't always to just equalize the math, but rather to make it so that angles and space worked against the one defender that you can't block so that they hopefully miss the tackle anyway? Well, that's what happened here. Most corners are shitty tacklers that don't know how to work through traffic and fill a lane, and the Patriots used that to their advantage to get a first down run into a stacked box. Fullbacks are what makes stuff like this possible. If you have someone that you can put into the backfield and tell them to seal out a 300 pound defensive lineman all by themselves so that your own offensive lineman can go get better matchups on the second level against linebackers, if that's in your toolbox, as a play caller, you can then do pretty much whatever you want to, anytime you want to. All right, if you're still with me, I hope that last part illustrated as best as I possibly could why teams that love to run the football have a good fullback on the roster. That does, once again, bring up that same question, though. What about the teams that don't have a fullback? Or even, what about the teams that still do have a fullback, but they want to be able to run two-back run concepts against an unfavorable box, but without having a traditional fullback on the field because they want that fifth skill position player to be somebody who might be a better receiver? Is it even possible to successfully rely on those same two-back run concepts that we just highlighted, but without having a human tractor trailer leading the way? Well, spoiler alert, yes, it is possible, and I'm going to highlight exactly how teams have been doing that in the NFL over the last couple of years, but before I do, I have a question to ask you. And this question is for everybody that's watching this in the middle of the day, and they're really hungry because they haven't eaten yet, and then they waited so long to eat that they got so hungry that they can't decide what to eat, so they go on YouTube and they're watching a bunch of videos to kill time until eventually they get so hungry that they can force their brain into making a decision through sheer self-preservation instinct. There's probably like four of you, and that's okay. This question is literally just for you four. Everybody else could probably skip this. Are you four aware that by the time you got to this ad read in the middle of this video, you could have taken a factor meal out of the fridge, unwrapped it, heated it up, eaten it, and licked the fork all with time to spare? I'm not kidding. I literally just did that right before filming this. Their Parmesan chicken was my dinner tonight. It took me like five minutes to heat it and eat it. That was it. You can keep being hungry if you want, but factor meals are literally for people like you. And I know that because I am people like you. Factor meals heat up in two minutes. They're all made from good ingredients. It's not frozen processed garbage. It tastes like real food and it satisfies you like real food because it is real food. And I rely on them on production days like this one where I only have a few minutes to eat. So if you want to try them out for yourself just to see if you like them and find them as clutch as I have in recent months, check out factor75.com at the link below and use code filmroom50 and that will give you 50% off your first factor box. Again, that is promo code filmroom50 at factor75.com in the link down below for 50% off your first box. Thank you once again to Factor for sponsoring this week's show. And with that, I have one last question for everybody else that probably hit the arrow key a few times on their keyboard and skipped over that ad read. Have you ever heard of Ben Skoranek? The LA Rams are a really interesting offense because they don't actually carry a fullback on the roster, and yet Sean McVay still has a lot of two-back runs in his playbook. And I know that for a fact because I literally have one of his old playbooks. It's all right there. They do exist. And so McVay still wants to access those pages of his playbook and be able to take advantage of the ambiguity of two-back looks from under center, even though he doesn't have a fullback. His solution to that problem is a 6'3", 225-pound wide receiver named Ben Skoranek, whose claim to fame is basically moonlighting as the Rams fullback. Whenever McVay wants to dial up a two-back run of any kind, whether it's outside zone, inside zone, counter, whatever, Skoranek is who they put on the field as their lead blocker, and he's damn good at it. Plus, at 225 pounds, maybe even 230 at this point, he is either the same size as or even bigger than many modern linebackers are. So he doesn't really have a size disadvantage to take on linebackers on the second level compared to receivers 10 or 15 years ago that all had to deal with a 255 pound mic like Brian Cushing, whose favorite Sunday activity was malevolent violence and destruction. The Rams get most of the advantages that come from 21 personnel looks, even though they spend most of their time in 11 personnel. That's a single back grouping with three receivers on the field. They just treat Skoranek, a receiver, as their other running back so they can get you into a nickel personnel grouping on defense because, of course, you think it's a pass play with all those receivers out there. 
Then they spread you out. Next thing you know, they motion into an eye formation at the drop of a hat and they just run the ball down your throat. And it works. It actually works a lot. Beyond just calling two back runs from 11 personnel though, we also see teams around the league calling two back runs from 12 personnel with two tight ends on the field and they treat their second tight end as a fullback. Atlanta was one of the best run games in the entire league last year simply because they have Parker Hesse as their second tight end who moonlights as a fullback. You could even argue that the only difference between Hesse and Kyle Juszczyk is the two little position letters next to their names on their respective rosters, but they essentially play the same role as hybrid tight ends slash fullbacks. And speaking of the 49ers, by the way, we've even seen them call two back runs from 11 personnel because they didn't want to tip their hand by putting Juszczyk on the field to begin with, but they still wanted the flexibility that comes from having an extra blocker that can insert into any gap from the backfield. So their solution was they just flipped around responsibilities and had the halfback, Jeff Wilson, play fullback and be a lead blocker for Debo Samuel, a receiver, to now be the new halfback on an outside zone call. This is basically positionless football here, but again, it worked super well. And on top of all of those little wrinkles, by the way, for teams that have multiple good halfbacks and quarterbacks that can also run, we've even seen a trend over the last several years in the NFL that of course worked its way up from high school and college because they've been doing this forever down there. Now we're seeing NFL teams line up in split back formations from shotgun and running zone reads where one of those halfbacks is flowing in one direction while the other halfback ostensibly acts as a fullback, lead blocking for the quarterback if he keeps the ball going the other way. And this puts defenses in a whole new type of bind because even if you know that a zone read is coming, you don't know what direction it's going in because there are halfbacks lined up on both sides that are both threats to carry the ball and they're flowing in opposite directions at the same time. So the edge defenders on either side can't tell if they're going to be the ones getting read by the quarterback or not. That leads to guessing and chasing ball carriers that don't actually have the ball and just total breakdowns in defensive discipline. To me, the future of the NFL is a future that every Texas high school football coach is already very well acquainted with. And that future is a bunch of non fullbacks playing fullback so that run games around the league can be more diverse like they used to be back in the mid 2000s when every NFL team used two back looks on like a third of their offensive snaps. Even just last year, the Chiefs put defensive tackle Colin Saunders in at fullback in a goal line situation. The Cowboys did the same with backup linebacker Luke Gifford. Hell, even the Rams experimented a bit by swapping out Ben Skoranek for their own edge rusher Michael Hoyt simply because they wanted a bit more size to try to cut down Nick Bosa on the backside of his zone run. We are going to see more of this. That much is very clear. And the teams that embrace that trend of fullback by committee the most are the teams that, in my opinion, are going to dominate the league. All right, that'll wrap it up for tonight. One quick housekeeping note before I get out of here, by the way, because I want to give uh, artists credit for their work. This is a Madeira cask finish bourbon from Weigel Whiskey. They're a uh, micro distillery, from what I understand, in Western PA. I visited them when I was in Pittsburgh a few weeks ago, and these people are fucking artists. They make incredible stuff. I brought back whatever bottles I could because they don't ship to California. And I, I'm going to cherish this, this stuff forever. It's, it's incredible. So if you find yourself in Western PA or anywhere near Western PA, go to Weigel Whiskey, get whatever bottles you want, because literally all of it's good. Like some of the best flights I've ever had. Um, now, speaking of Pittsburgh, by the way, if you're a Yinzer yourself, or if you're an AFC North fan or an NFC North fan, or a fan of any football team, and you haven't been keeping up on our team by team preview series over on the podcast channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast, that's an hour to an hour and a half on every single team, individual episodes plus division episodes. It's a 40 show long series that goes nine weeks long this summer. We're directly in the middle of it now. Um, so if you want more content from me, because I certainly release a lot more over on the podcast channel than on this channel, you can go check that out. Again, Bootleg Football Podcast. Um, if you're a fucking nerd for football, it's the show for you. Uh, all right, I got nothing else for you. I'll see you all back here very soon. And until then, cheers. <laughs>